Hello, everyone. We are so excited to have you join us for our fourth session of the 2021 Tennessee Farmers Market Vendor Boot Camp webinar series. We have a lot of information to cover, we're, so we're calling this a regulatory roundup where we'll be talking about um, assorted business and product regulations um, for, for various topics that we'll get into soon. The next couple of sessions will be about uh, on Thursday, we'll be hearing specifically from the Department of Health and their um, food sampling and food unit law. And then we will be hearing about food manufacturing regulations for the Tennessee Food Freedom Act and other uh, other product regulations uh, more in depth because that co covers a lot of, of folks. But we're going to talk about some various regulations today. Just as a reminder, I, we can get a little bit of, of heated and debate about regulations, but this session is an educational session. We want you to know what the current regulations are to the best of our knowledge and, and of how we can answer questions. Um, and this is not a forum to debate whether those are, are right or wrong, um, but we, they are what they are. And so we're gonna talk about what they are and, and what folks are expected to comply with. I am not a regulator, I am an educator. Uh, so definitely um, if, if we wanna talk about changing regulations, that's a whole nother forum and a good place to talk with, with your legislatures about that. Um, Bethany McNulty is from the Department of Agriculture and is here to talk about pet food and pet treats. So she is very knowledgeable about that topic, but uh, their department typically makes rules based on what the regulators uh, or what the legislators tell them <laughs> needs to be rules so, or uh, about. So uh, that's the route to go with that. Neither Bethany nor myself, to my knowledge, Bethany is is an attorney. Uh, so again, this is for educational and informational purposes, and not is not intended to replace the need to consult with regulating agencies or as uh, legal advice. So that's my little disclaimer <laughs> for today. But we do want to keep you out of hot water, uh, and as risk management, we definitely want you to to follow regulations. Um, in order to to keep your your business going in the right direction so we are going to cover a lot of of territory here in the the next hour uh, we're going to talk about business licenses and taxes sales tax as it applies um, to farmers market regulations for selling meat uh, there are regulations for beef pork lamb and goat and different regulations for poultry uh, there's some regulation for eggs and milk and dairy products and pet food and pet treats. Now, we could give an hour presentation on each of these topics. So we're going to hit the highlights and provide you with some additional resources uh, to go from there. And we want you to know enough to be able to ask questions and, and get to the right folks for help. So um, we're, we're going to dive in here as dive in here and I will say when I send uh, the slides uh, for what I'm presenting there may be some bonus slides in there with a little bit of extra information and um, additional resources that we don't have time to cover in the webinar today but you will have those to look out at and find links to use um, as you move forward. So let's dive in here to talk about uh, business licenses and taxes, such a lovely topic, exciting topic here, <laughs> but a necessary one. So a business license is basically a legal document that the government prov provides that allows you to do business in a specific geographic location. And every county in the state requires a business license and many cities do as well. Um, and there are uh, separate licenses that may be required for a county or a city of each location, I should say each permanent location where sales are made. So typically um, uh, farmers at farmers markets, you may need a business license in the, in the county where your farm is, 
if you're required to have one or your business is, but if you're selling at farmer's markets, if they're considered a temporary location, then you don't need one in the location where the farmer's market is itself. Now, I did read this morning that if um, if you're selling at a place for for six months straight, then that's not considered a a um, temporary location anymore. So we need to to recognize that and and uh, check into those requirements. And the business license regulations have changed in the last year, uh, making it uh, a little bit easier. So any person in business for profit or gain who has gross annual sales of non-raised products of more than $3,000 needs a business license. So we're going to talk about some exemptions from business licenses. Basically, anybody who makes $3,000 or more in sales will need a, a business license. You are exempt if you are a farmer that's selling only the farm products that, that you raised on your farm. Uh, so you're growing strawberries and you sell those from the farm and, and you're only selling one you raised, you don't need a business license. Similarly, if you're making a value-added product like this strawberry preserves here, then, and you're only using the products that you raised on the farm, and adding salt, water, sugar, pectin, and preservatives, you are also exempt from needing a business license. Otherwise, you need a business license. Um, there are two levels of business license, and this is where the major change in, and oh, I have too many zeros in that slide. We're getting a little crazy with the zeros. But minimum activity license is needed when you have um, annual sales of non-raised products of $3,000 to just up to $100,000 in a city or county, and that costs you um, $15 per year, and you're not subject to business tax. You do need um, a, a full-on business license when you have gross annual sales of $100,000 or more. And that is also a $15 business license, but at that point you're subject to business tax, which is not a huge tax, but definitely something you need to consider. You also renew that full-on business license annually, uh, but it's no charge for that initial fee when your business tax return is, is filed. So let's look at a couple of examples. Um, in example A, Farmer Smith only sells vegetables produced on our farm at the market with sales expected to reach $10,000 this year. Does she need a business license? Well, no, she's only selling products she raise. So Farmer Jones sells vegetable produce on his farm and purchased some berries from another farmer to resell. Does he need a business license? Well, it depends if Farmer Jones sells $3,000 or more in products that he didn't raise on his farm, then he needs a minimal activity license. Okay, Hal breaks bread in his private residence under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act and sells it at the market with expected sales of $5,000. Does he need a business license? Yes. It doesn't matter whether products are, are made under the ten, Tennessee Food Freedom Act or not. That doesn't... Uh, exempt folks from the business license or sales tax laws that only uh, lets them make that food in a private residence without uh, being inspected uh, for a food manufacturer. So what about Dave who raises hogs and markets meat only from animals he has raised at the market? Well, this is another tricky one because it depends if um, Dave sells $3,000 or more of sausage or other products that might have herbs or ingredients that weren't raised on his farm, other than salt, sugar, water, pectin, and preservatives, then he needs to obtain a minimal activity license. Um, or if he sells $100,000 of that product, he would need the full-on uh, business license. So if you are in need of one, you would visit the county clerk's office. Uh, that is gross sales. Good question. Gross sales. 
So you would visit the county clerk or your city tax collector or both if you need that for forms that are required for that jurisdiction and pay the license fee. And then you would um, exhibit those uh, licenses where you're, where you're making sales where that is required. And then you have some bonus slides that will tell you some additional resources for that that we'll be sending out. We're gonna move on to sales tax. So sales tax is a privilege tax that, tax that permits you to sell personal property at retail or render certain services at retail or charge admission to events as if anyone is doing some agritourism type activities. There are some exemptions for sales tax as well for farmers on products that you sell. So farm products that are sold by the farmer who raised them are exempt from sales tax. You don't need to collect and remit sales tax on those products. Certain sales of farm products that you purchased from the farmer who raised them, and that is really important, are also exempt uh, from sales tax, and that's just certain sales. So we'll get more into that next. So the farmer who raises the product may be an individual or a business entity. So for example, this is Hank and Cindy Delvin. You can either purchase those products from Hank or Cindy or for, from Delvin Farms. It doesn't matter as long as, as that, that entity raised them. Um, the same farmer must both raise and sell the farm product for uh, the sale to be exempt. So if you are purchasing farm products that are raised from a farmer and you're going to resale those, those are exempt when the products are purchased from the farmer who raised them and the total amount of farm products raised and sold in a calendar year must be at least 50% of total sales. So we're going to look at an example of that. So the farmer who raised them, uh, you bought from the farmer who raised them, and it's limited to less than half of your sales. So do these vendors need to collect or remit sales tax? So in example A, Farmer Smith only sells vegetables produced on our farm at the market with sales expected to reach $10,000 this year. Does she need to collect or remit sales tax? No, she never needs to collect or remit sales tax on um, products she raised as long as it's sold, raised and sold in the same entity. In example B, Farmer Jones sells vegetables produced on his farm with $10,000 in gross sales and purchases some berries from a farmer who grew them to resell. And he purchased $3,000 in, um, those berries bought $3,000 in sales. So does he need to collect and remit sales tax? No, not on any of that product, not on what he grew and not on what he purchased from a farmer who grew them and resold them because it's less than 50% of his sales and he bought them from the farmer who grew them. Now, when we get into sales for value added product, um, this also comes down to uh, whether or not it's only in uh, raised ingredients or non-engraised ingredients are limited to salt, water, sugar, pectin, or preservatives. So that jam we talked about earlier, uh, that strawberry preserves, assuming we didn't do anything fancy and put any cinnamon or, or other spices in there that we didn't raise, then those are also exempt from sales tax, uh, collecting or remitting sales tax. So you may also, we, we have to make this a little complicated, right? So you may also have total sales up to $4,800 per year of non-raised products and you do not have to charge sales tax as long as you have paid sales tax to the suppliers if they are required to, to collect it. So for example, you could sell up to $4,800 of bread you baked at the farmer's market and you don't have to charge sales tax as long as you have paid sales tax on the ingredients, right? <clears throat> so a couple of questions here. If you only, if you plan to only sell ten thousand dollars in sales, but you find at the end of the year you sold fifteen, can you purchase the upgraded license and not be in trouble? Um, well, for the business license, 
um, you can sell up to $100,000 now. So you would be fine up to $100,000 and be fine with a minimal activity license. Mark, if that's not your question, try again and I'll try again as well. So for value added goat soap that uses essential oils for scent, is sales tax required? Yes. Um, and if you purchase lye or um, any other ingredients that you did not grow other than water, sugar, pectin, or preservatives, yes. If you are bottling milk, and you add chocolate to it, and you sell $4,800 or more in chocolate milk, I don't think we have any cocoa production here, <laughs> then that would be taxable as well. So anything other than water, sugar, pectin, salt, and preservatives, um, that would be um, taxable. <coughs> so sorry. So we've got a couple more examples here. So John makes strawberry preserves with strawberries grown on his farm, sugar and pectin in his private residence of the Tennessee Food Freedom Act and sells it at the market with expected sales of $15,000 this year. Is Does he need to collect and remit sales tax? No, because it's only his farm grown strawberries and sugar and pectin. Example dear, D, Dave is back here with hogs and markets meat again from the animals he raised at the farm market. Does he need to collect or remit sales tax? Well, it depends, right? If he sells more than $4,800 of sausage or products that have herbs or ingredients that weren't raised on his farm, then, then he would need to collect or remit sales tax on those products, that sausage or whatever it is. <clears throat> that has those extra ingredients in it. There is a retail exemption. If selling to others who have intent to sell that item, like if you're selling to a grocery store, a convenience store, or a restaurant, then you would not collect and remit sales tax for those products as long as they can give you a copy of their resale certificate. Um, and similarly with nonprofits, if you're selling something to to a school or something, they may have a, a certificate, a check or payment would need to come from that nonprofit entity. And you would need a, a, a copy of their tax exempt certificate to keep in your files. You would register to pay sales tax with the Tennessee Department of Revenue. And you'll you'll see receive a certificate of registration. I'm sorry, registration, and a blanket certificate of resale, so that you can buy products that you're going to make, um, and sell without paying sales tax when you buy those ingredients, since you're going to resell them. You can find um, the tax rate online. There's a state sales tax rate, usually it's 7%. For food, I believe it's 4%. And then each local place um, has their own rate that adds on top of that. So again, you'll have some additional bonus slides, but we will, uh, hopefully that's enough to help you know whether you need to investigate that further and have, have some additional resources to do that. And if you have questions, we can help you with those here as well. We have some great contacts at the Department of Revenue. So let's talk now about meat sales um, at farmer's markets or really at any location in the state for beef, pork, lamb, and goat. To be able to sell meat to household consumers, like we often do at farmer's markets, maybe you're on the farm or road sand or even deliver to folks, that is regulated by the Tennessee Department of Agriculture and the United States Department of Agriculture. So folks need to have a retail meat sales permit from the Tennessee Department of Agriculture Consumer and Industry Services that costs $50 annually. And I believe that is on the state fiscal year. So July 1, you would get a new permit for the year. They will want to come out and do an inspection and look at your label, look at your facilities, talk about how you're storing and transporting that meat, making sure that it's going to stay wholesome from when it use the, leaves the USDA inspected processing facility to where it, you get it to the consumer. You will get a permit uh, when you've passed that inspection and paid your fee uh, to, to post. Any meat that is sold, beef, pork, lamb, or goat in the state of Tennessee, 
that to receive that retail meat sales permit needs to be processed at a USDA inspected meat processing facility under USDA inspection. They will they will cut it, they will or and process it, they will package it, label it, um, and either refrigerate it or freeze it for you, and you will pick it up from there. And that's the only way you can get one of those retail meat sales permits. As far as we know, there are 21 meat processing facilities that are USDA inspected that will process for um, producers in the state. And you can also use USDA inspected processing facilities across state lines. Meat must be sold by weight. So I can't sell you that uh, four pound roast for $20. I have to sell you that four pound roast for $5 a pound for $20. And I need to make sure you know what kind of roast that is. Is it a um, chuck roast or a prime rib roast? Those are quite different. Okay, so you need to, to clearly communicate what the product is and what it weighs and um, how much per pound uh, that meat is. Your, your label has to have the product name, a handling and statement, the name and address of the packer, manufacturer, or distributor, that may be you as the farmer, that USDA mark of inspection and establishment number, and the net weight on the package and safe handling instructions. If there's more than one ingredient in that meat, like that sausage we talked about earlier, the ingredients need to be listed on the label in order of predominance by weight. And your processing facility will help you do all, will do all that for you, but you need to make sure all that's on there. Um, if there's random weight items like um, steaks or roast, often um, we've got to have the price per pound and total price um, on the label. Um, right now, the Department of Agriculture has has made a little bit of a a deviation from that. If that's frozen, it has to have the weight on it, and then um, you can post the price per pound and can calculate the total price at the register. For fresh standard weight items, oftentimes ground meat is in a hundred or in one or two pound chubs and all of it's the same, then you don't have to have the the um, price per pound on the package either, even if it's just refrigerated. <laughs> they are some suggestions for additional label uh, components to include a code date or lot number on the label and hopefully the processor can do this for you as well. In case of a recall, you can recall just the items that were affected or the date uh, that items were process affected. If not, and you can't determine what product is what, you have to recall all of it. So that can be a really good risk management method. And then sometimes folks want to put a um, special statement or claim on their uh, packages, maybe grass-fed, for example. Um, that takes some special USDA approval. It's a, an additional process, so even if it's in the name of your business. In order to get that retail meat sales permit, your storage practices must prevent cross-contamination. So if you've got a, a, a stand-up freezer, and you do uh, maybe beef and poultry, you can't put the poultry and beef in the same, you know, stand up or chest freezer, um, or it needs to be segregated. Uh, so that pull so it nothing gets contaminated there. If you have a big walk in freezer, and you put things on separate walls or can separate things somehow, then you're able to do that. But you'd want to talk to your ins inspector about that. You need to have thermometers in your units to verify temperature. Refrigerated product has to be 41 degrees Fahrenheit or below. And frozen must be hard frozen. No refreezing of product is permitted. So if you're at the farmer's market and something thaws out a little bit, that's your dinner. Um, you can't refreeze it and, and sell it um, at that point. Hands and outer clothing of anybody handling meat has to be clean. Uh, you can transport meat in... Uh, coolers. Uh, we don't put ice in the cooler that can melt and you don't want your, your meat to be sitting in ice, but you can use those frozen gel packs or dry ice. Some people use coolers and an inverter or generator to keep that meat cold. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, special label claims um, very much just to save time, but you're if you're interested in that on your animals, you can 
on your meet, let me know and we can talk about that uh, as well and, and another uh, publication that may be helpful. Okay, we're going to talk briefly about meat and poultry. And I am going to say this is probably the topic that I know least about. Um, <laughs> we we typically have other people in the center who cover this topic and um, they have uh, retired or, or left us. So I'm going to do my best here. Um, if you are doing uh, poultry like chicken or duck, for uh, example, um, you... Are, there are several options. So the first option is to take those to a USDA inspected processor or put in a USDA inspected facility where some, and at those, some, an inspector is there bird by bird to inspect the harvest of that. There is one of those in Tennessee one of, and there are, are some in Kentucky that I know folks have used. So just like, uh, those birds are harvested, processed, packaged, and labeled at a USDA inspected slaughter facility. You would get a retail meat sales permit from the Tennessee Department of Agriculture, similar to the meat we just talked about. And you would maintain the wholesomeness and temperature of that through handling, transport, and storage. And those would have a USDA stamp on the label. Uh, one benefit of this is you can sell that product across state lines. There are several benefits of this, but but that is certainly one of them. There is an option, <coughs> excuse me, for on-farm processing of your own poultry under a USDA in, in exemption. So, but exemption may not mean may not mean what do you think it does? Um, there is an allowance that you can uh, you can process your own birds that's limited based on whether you're processing your own birds or if you're processing for other folks. The number of birds uh, gets you into different categories. Um, different categories allows you to market to different market channels, whether direct to consumers, a retail store, hotel, restaurant, or institution. And these are limited to sales only within Tennessee. You cannot sell birds processed on your farm under the exemption out of state. So what does this exemption mean? The exemption means that there's no USDA or Tennessee Department of Agriculture inspector on your property watching the bird by bird processing. Um, there's no application, no inspection or license required to begin. You do have to process under sanitary conditions. The, the same procedures that uh, another processing facility would do to produce sound, clean poultry products that are fit for human consumption. Now, USDA or TDA may inspect your processor facility at any time. They have the right to come and, and make sure you're doing those sanitary conditions and procedures. For this, the Tennessee Department of Agriculture will not issue a retail meat sales permit. And sometimes farmers markets may require that. Um, the Department of Agriculture may write a letter and say, you know, they're processing under a, a, an exemption and we don't issue permits for that. So it's not possible for, the, for them to get one. And at that point, then the farmers market or, or whatever, um, market channel would determine whether those products would be allowed for sale there. There are requirements for labels for that uh, on-farm processing under the USDA inspection. The processor's name and address, it has to have this statement exempt PL 90-492 that shows that, that they are being processed under that exemption. Safe handling instructions and again that lot number code date is, is recommended. These cannot include a USDA stamp because they are not USDA inspected. There are some more details in a, a publication that uh, my uh, former coworker who has retired, Hal Pepper, put together on our website. I've lost the chat box, but I, <laughs> and we're good. Okay. So let's move on to egg sales. This is one that we get quite a few um, questions about and the rules for these have, have changed in the last few years. 
So there used to be a Tennessee egg law that applied to um, producers of small flocks, but that was repealed in July of 2020. So Tennessee doesn't have any specific egg sales regulations. Um, so producers must follow the federal regulations for eggs. The caveat there is, uh, I guess it's not a regulation on the producers, but for a potential customer of of you all, if retail food stores are permitted by the Tennessee Department of Agriculture in order to have their store and sell food. And those retail food stores do have requirements for the products that they sell. And so that comes into play in a minute. Also with some of these regulations, eggs in particular, but others um, maybe for milk and maybe even the poultry that we talked about, there are some shalls versus shoulds, okay, <laughs> or some, some possible shoulds to consider. So shall are the rules and regulations, okay, what, what does the law tell you you shall do in order to be compliant and produce products legally? Um, and then there should, that might be recommendations that would put into risk management considerations for food safety, um, risk management and also, you know, uh, marketing risks, what may be appealing um, to customers or, or are you able to market dif to different marketing channels or across state lines. So we're gonna think about that a little bit later in here with the eggs. So we're gonna talk about what the, what, what the regulations say. So the federal regulations for small flocks or producers with fewer than 3,000 laying hens, that sounds like a lot of laying hens to me. Um, there are some exemptions from the major egg regulation requirements. So producers with fewer than 3,000 laying hens who own the hens raise the hens and pack the eggs themselves are exempt from many of the federal rules and regulations. So the regulations say for these small flock producers that the safe handling instructions have to be on the, the carton, okay, or the, the package. And the, the, these are required and it has to appear prominently and conspicuously. The safe handling instructions has to be in all caps and in bold. The text of the safe handling instruction has to be in a hairline box on the principal display panel or the informational panel. And it can be inside the carton if keep refrigerated is added to that principal display panel or information panel. This is the only requirement. So the law says it needs to have safe handling instruction on it. The law does not require eggs to be refrigerated or to be um, washed or sanitized, okay? That is what the law says. Now, we'll talk about should a little bit later on um, in this case. Um, now, if the Department of Agriculture uh, USDA or TDA comes across eggs that are dirty and what they would call adulterated, then you're still going to have some ramifications. You're not able to sell those eggs. So you've got to have, you know, a clean, you know, safe product there. If you're looking to sell to retail stores um, or to food service, um, retail stores are permitted by the Tennessee Department of Agriculture and their store inspectors will be looking for eggs to be clean and cold, so washed and sanitized, refrigerated in a new container, and labeled with the farm producer name, address, and ungraded or unclassified eggs in addition to that safe handling instructions. So we maybe on the should side, some recommendations to consider. You know, producers are not exempt from providing a, a wholesome, food product or from food safety liability. So um, we may want to uh, consider some of those, the cleaning and sanitation, and we've got a resource for you later for that. Also from a marketing standpoint, you know, you might want to put some more information than is required on those eggs to kind of brand them and communicate with customers whose they are um, 
how to get in touch with you um, and include that code date or lot number in case that there's a problem and so that they know how fresh those eggs are. Um, and then this publication includes some suggested practices for washing and sanitizing the eggs that would like for you to consider. All right. We are breezing through these. I'm going to try to check that chat box one more time. I think we're doing okay there. And we're going to talk about milk and dairy products. So when we're um, marketing milk or dairy products um, that are edible um, dairy products, we those must be properly packaged, uh, pr those produced, packaged, and labeled in a licensed food manufacturing facility. It also has to be properly transported and stored to maintain the whole wholesomeness of that product. So all the temperature, cleanliness, et cetera, that, that go along with doing that. Currently, in the state of Tennessee, it is illegal for any person to produce, manufacture, process, package, transport, <laughs> sell, offer for sale, trade, or barter for raw milk or raw milk products. There are a couple of exceptions for this. There um, are some regulations for allowing for the owner's personal consumption or use, and for raw milk butter. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that. So that personal consumption or use is uh, for an independent or partial owner of a hoofed mammal can use that milk from that mammal for their own personal consumption or other personal use. So there are, there's a lot in that statement and all of the aspects of that have to be met. So personal consumption or use of raw milk. If it is from a hoofed mammal, ownership, you have ownership of the animal that produced the milk. And that might mean I own my own cow and I'm going to milk that cow and I'm going to drink it. Or I might own you know, 50% interest in a cow and I get 50% of the milk from that cow and, and I use it that way or in a herd share arrangement. It has to be for personal consumption or other use. I can't sell it. I can't trade it. I can't barter it um, for others. Okay. Under this personal consumption or use, there is no testing, inspection, regulation, or, or license um, out there. Again, it is limited to personal use of the owner. You can't sell it, um, offer for trade, or barter across state lines, even if that state across state lines allows raw milk. You can't take it out of the state of Tennessee and, and do those things. This is a big one that I'm not sure folks realize as well. This applies only to unfinished products. So so milk, raw milk. If I own a cow and I have, um, I sell an interest in that cow or interest in my herd with somebody else, that herd share only extends to milk. I cannot make any other product out of that milk. I can't make cheese. I can't make yogurt. I can't make anything and include that as part of a herd share. And I think quite a bit of that may be going on. Um, but that is the, the latest, uh, application of that rule that I have heard. There is also an exemption in the law related to raw milk butter, and this allows for the sale of the retail sale, sale of unpasteurized raw butter. If all of these following requirements are met, so it's produced in a separate facility from pasteurized products. It's only sold within the state of Tennessee, and it's produced by someone who already has a licensed dairy plant by the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. So if I don't have a milk processing facility on my farm already that's licensed as a dairy plant, I can't just make raw milk butter and sell it under this exemption. This is for people who already have a, a dairy plant and and they produce this raw milk butter in another separate facility. 
And of course, it's subject to the requirements of the Tennessee Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And, and again, none of this can be adulterated or we shouldn't be selling it. Now, this is a very high level overview of this topic as well. Um, but fortunately, there was uh, an entire hour devoted to milk at the market last year um, at the Farmer's Market Vendor Boot Camp. And if you are interested more in that topic, then uh, you can check out this tiny link and watch that whole entire hour. And I, I'm glad to see that we have some, some milk soaps and lotions products. We're working on some things at the center for resources uh, for that that we hope to have available in the, in the next few months. There is uh, the Food and Dairy uh, Regulation, Consumer and Industry Services Division wanted me to share this phone number. Some of them wanted to be on today, but we couldn't just, we just couldn't get the information, the uh, time to work out. And so, you know, you're welcome to call and, and visit them more with about these as well. Brittany, you are brilliant because you are asking a question that is the perfect segue uh, to uh, our next topic. Uh, and thankfully, you'll get to some, talk to uh, an expert on this topic uh, and someone other than me uh, about that. So what about selling raw milk labeled as pet milk? I see that where I live all the time. And interestingly, Bethany McAnally, uh, Bethany, I'm going to stop sharing and let you load that works with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture um, in their their feed and input, and I may have butchered that, Bethany, <laughs> um, it's okay. section, and she'll tell us all about that. But we can't do that without following some rules. There are rules for selling pet food and pet treats, and I'm really excited that Bethany is going here uh, in order to share that with us. Thank you, Megan. Um, again, I am Bethany McAnulty. I'm really excited that we get to do this because I get calls daily um, from people who are trying to get in a farmer's market and the farmer's market has told them they need a commercial feed license. Um, so just to get it expedited a little bit quicker, we try to inform everybody before the hand. So this is a great um, avenue for that. You guys, so first I'm going to talk about the licensing of pet food. Any um, commercial feed, any animal feed does fall under the commercial feed law. So our pet food and pet treats fall under that law. Um, that law says that any person who manufactures, distributes, or guarantees commercial feed in Tennessee must obtain a commercial feed license from our department um, for each location where the feed is being distributed. Um, and it must be filed with an annual statement of tonnage. Um, these licenses are renewed annually from July 1 to June 30th. On those licenses is where you would report tonnage. The cost of the license is $50 unless you sell over 350 tons and then it's based off of your tonnage sold. Um, most of the farmer market sales that we see stick with that $50 though. Um, Tennessee is one of the rare states that does not make use register the individual product so any recipe you have you can sell under that license as long as the manufacturer name is licensed. We have a couple of people who like to sell um, cat treats and dog treats and they want them under different um, the manu different manufacturer names in which case you would have to get two different licenses for that. <clears throat> um, the next is our labeling guidelines. Um, you would have to have your product name on there. The product name could be as simple as um, beef dog food um, and the species that it's intended for. So the product, that product, like I said, beef dog food um, that says it's dog food for beef. So, or um, not dog food for beef, I'm sorry. Beef food for dogs. So you would have the first two just within that product name. Um, the next that we get a lot of questions on is our guaranteed analysis. You must put these four RMS, your crude protein, crude fat, crude fiber, and your moisture. Um, 
it's recommended that it be sent to a lab to become get the percentages. However, it's not a requirement. Oops, I'm sorry. There we go. Um, it's not a requirement. If you can come up with these guarantees yourself, then you can put them on there. Um, it just is a more accurate guarantee if you get it lab tested. Uh, next is our ingredient list. And they are listed by in descending order. So whatever ingredient has the most, you would be the first and so on and so forth. Um, all ingredients do, does need to be approved through AFCO or the FDA. Those ingredient lists, I have several people, um, they don't want to purchase the AFCO manual to get the ingredients. So they'll just usually just send me a list of ingredients and I'll go in and check them for them. Um, but all those are available on the FDA's website as well. Um, you do have to also put feeding instructions. It would have to say treat or snack. If it doesn't say treat or snack, um, it, this is the exact terminology that has to be on the label. This product is intended for intermitt intermittent or supplemental feeding only. Um, the name and address of the manufacturer would be next. If your street address is listed um, locally, publicly, you don't have to put the street address, um, but you would still need to put city, state, and zip code. I have that question a lot because people don't want their home addresses on there. Um, finally, it would be the quality uh, quantity statement. Um, a lot of times with pet treats, if you do, you know, one treat in the bag or however many treats, that is um, enough for us. So I think Brittany asked the question um, about pet milk. There are two additional requirements that are included for raw milk. Um, you have to put the species in which the milk was obtained. So raw cow, raw goat. Um, and you also must put on there warning not for human consumption. And Jeremy said the slide mentions label requirements, but the analysis is not required. The lab analysis is required. It's just not required to come, or the analysis is required on the label. It's just not required to come from a lab. So if you're using oats, peanut butter, and bananas, if you can come up with all of those, do the math and figure out your own guaranteed analysis, that's acceptable. Um, however, you would be subject to violation if that analysis is not correct. So the safest bet is to go through the lab. It's just not a requirement to go through a lab. Um, so the only label suggestion I do have that's not required would be lot numbers. The reason for this is excuse me, that if the, if the lot comes in violation, um, it would be just subject to that one lot. If you don't have lot numbers, then it would be subject to the entire product line that you have. Um, the lot number can be as, as simple as the date that you make the product. So I think I had another question. Oh, no. Um, so if you are at the farmer's market, you may see an inspector come up and they may ask to take your product. Um, that would be just for them to bring back to our lab and to test that guaranteed analysis. Our lab would test for protein fi fiber, mycotoxins, <coughs> contaminants, um, micro minerals or moisture contact um, content, depending on what um, the product is versus if it was a pet food or a pet treat. And as you can see, pet treats, we usually just do protein and mycotoxins. Um, if our lab finds it to be out of compliance, a stop sale, stop sale would be issued. Um, typically what happens is our inspector would contact the manufacturer, which would be you. <clears throat> and then we would figure out if it were 
something like salmonella, the product would have to be disposed of. But if it was something as simple as your protein was 12 and it should have been 11, we can do a label change. So some of those are simple and some of them are a little more difficult and costly. Um, so that is about all I have. If you scan this QR code, it will bring up all of our regulations um, and how to apply for a commercial feed license. It's an online form. That online form is linked in here. And this is my information. If you have any other questions, you can contact me as well. That is great, Bethany. That really is is helpful, and we hope you'll help get the word out, folks. To to um, folks maybe who uh, aren't uh, aren't following this, we've got a great question from Donna here. Can those pet treats be made in your home or in your uh, at your private residence? Um, they can, and that actually um, leads me. I meant to say that the Cottage Food Law Tennessee Freedom Act does not um, apply to animal food. We get that question a lot as well, that if we're making it in our home, does it fall under that law? It does not, but you can make them in your home. That was a great question. Do we have any other questions, especially for Bethany, because she <laughs> oh, she is generous enough to be here with us or on any of these topics today? Let's see. Oh, that's a good question about uh, would non-GMO corn for chicken feed fall under these requirements? So... It would depend on how um, the corn, if it was processed, it would be, fall under the requirements. Um, the exemptions for that is if it's not adulterated. So if it's cr any cracked corn, then it would fall under the requirements. Excellent. Okay. And we have a question about can you please clarify sales tax on wool, wool yarn, or wool items from sheep raised on your farm? Crystal, that is an ex excellent question. And I will say, I don't think that I have ever asked the Department of Revenue related to wool, but I'm wondering if, the, if you were dyeing it, how that would impact it. That may make it... Um, um, that may make it taxable, but I'm going to write your name down. Wool items. Um, and see if I can get some clarification because that is. We'll try to explore that one a little bit more. So Jeremiah, you were asking similarly about rabbit pelts. Do you do anything to rabbit pelts? Um, Yeah, um, rabbit pellets, and I see somebody also asked about um, bird feeders made for both of those. You would have to be licensed um, since it's being consumed by the animal. And for licensing purposes, cracked corn would be considered as processing in this situation. I saw that question too come up a second ago. Great. Susan, are you asking about sales tax for the bird feeders or are you asking about um, the um, pet food and treats? These are some excellent questions. You guys are getting innovative with your products and, and uh, branching out. Oh, for, for wild birds.
So from a sales tax, I guess, is the, is the food, is the food, are you raising all of that? If not, if you're buying anything to go in, in it, um, that's probably sales taxable. Um, but Bethany, I don't uh, is wild yeah. bird feed. <laughs> yeah, it's still considered a commercial feed um, okay. product. I didn't include it in pet food because I feel like most of the farmers markets are pet food related. But any sure. um, <clears throat> anything made to be distributed to animals are considered. So even like squirrel feed. corn or that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Great. Very good. It is difficult to prepare for every possible question. So I'm glad that you all are asking these questions. Well, we, we will, um, let's see. What about the containers that farm praised produce go into? The, my understanding was that any container is taxable unless you give it away with food. I, so, you know, there, there's different levels of a container. So we think about that a lot with plants right if you go to a nursery and buy a plant you it has to be in something or you're gonna just have a handful of dirt with a plant in it so if you get like just the run-of-the-mill very boring <laughs> you know plastic pot pot or, you know a, a thing that the the plant was grown in or something that's considered part of the product but if there's anything um you know, ornate or fancy about it, then that would be, um, that then would become taxable and the, the plant with it, because if you're selling, if you're selling it as a bundle, then the, if there's anything taxable in the bundle, the bundle becomes taxable. Um, okay. That's a good question. If I sell a gift basket, um, if you, if, if that basket is a bundle and, and one thing in that basket is taxable, the whole, my understanding, the whole basket becomes taxable. The same things with, if I offer a hayride to the pumpkin patch, the hayride is taxable. The pumpkin is not taxable, but if I put it together in a, in a combo ticket, you know, it's $10 to ride the wagon to the back and you pick a pumpkin then the whole $10 become taxable. Uh, then if I would have sold the pumpkin separately, if I grew that pumpkin, right, or, or uh, follow all the other rules, then that tax pumpkin would not be taxable. So my, my thought, my uh, instinct there is if anything in a bundle is taxable, the whole ta whole bundle gets taxed. So Yes, and we have a really great, um, the Department of Revenue has a good um, email that you can send questions to, and I like it because it's written. You send questions to that email, they email you back, so you have a written answer to your question. You just want to be very careful to fully explain the situation, because sometimes if you change one little thing in a situation, that gives you a different answer, and I'll make sure you will, you will have that email in the, the slides that I send. And Bethany, if you wouldn't mind, if you would send me a PDF or send me your presentation, if you don't mind, I'll make a PDF and send your slides out as well so folks have, have those to refer to later. Sure. That would be wonderful. All right. Thank you all for your time today. I will put the link to the um, evaluation form and attendance form for TAEP in the chat box and I will send out a, a reminder with the um, uh, link to the YouTube where the recordings are and some other information for you all and I look forward to seeing you on Thursday and I'll, I'll give a preemptive thank you to Elena Boyd in my office who will be kind of moderating and running that session for me on Thursday, um, unless something changes, I appreciate her doing that. But we'll have Lori Lamaster with the Tennessee Department of Health to talk about some of their um, regulations that affect farmers market vendors. So bring your questions there as well. 
Thank you, Bethany. Once again, I really appreciate your time uh, today uh, to, to share your information. And I think it's always wonderful uh, for me and others to see there's a person <laughs> up in, in Nashville that is uh, trying to make things work for folks and, and helpful. And, and it makes things a little bit less scary when you know there's a human on the other end. So appreciate you being with us today.